I found this particular story in a very deep, very dark corner of your intertubes and figured it needed to be read. I do not know the credits, I do not know its provenance, but here we go. God, it had been a long patrol. Every man felt it, from Captain Abele himself, all the way down to Seaman Travis, who everyone knew was nowhere near old enough to have enlisted. But it didn't matter. Every man jack of them had raised their right hands, and by God and country they were going to follow through on their oaths, no matter how long it took. Because the enemy was still out there and the United States still needed defending. Their boat was brand spanking new out of the yards in Connecticut when they first took her out, but war had a way of wearing equipment faster than you'd expect. Over the course of their patrol, they'd become accustomed to every little creek, every idiosyncrasy, every fiddly dial, and every other little quirk that over time, turns a submarine like this one into a home. It certainly wasn't home-home for any of her crew. That title was reserved for their families and friends back in the States. But it was impossible to spend this long in these kinds of quarters and not feel some kind of camaraderie, not only with each other, but with the boat as well. And wanting to be anywhere but here or not, they still had a job to do. Thinking of his three boys back in Chili Groton, Captain Abele, Jim to his family and inside the wardroom, pressed his face to the periscope lens in the control room and took a long, slow sweep of the horizon around the boat. They hadn't had a sighting in a few days now, but surfacing was always a dangerous time for a submarine, and a little caution never hurt. Satisfied with what he saw, he nodded to the diving officer of the watch, Lieutenant Junior Grade Dighton, with his beautiful Savannah-born southern accent. Accent or no, though, no one really needed to say anything. Everyone knew what day it was, and what was going on. The officer put his hand on the plainsman's shoulder, and Seaman Frank started adjusting the submarine's ballast tanks and trim planes to surface the boat. A few minutes later, the conning tower of their boat seamlessly broke through the waves, and the hull settled into its not terribly gentle ride on the surface. Their sub may have come up to the surface, or at least close, on a regular basis to recharge her batteries and replenish their air, but the ride was never, certainly never, a comfortable one. Almost immediately, the control room was full. Seventy sailors and officers packed into the tight space, all looking at Radioman Dole as he warmed up the vacuum tubes and circuits on his radio set. In the background, Radioman Binston cranked up the antenna to give them a little better reception. The weather outside was not kind. Dole flipped a switch, and suddenly the popping and hissing of the background noise of the universe filled the control room of the boat, otherwise eerily quiet with all those submariners crowded in. Everyone simply listened and waited. The schedule for the transmission was always a little hard to pin down, but the crew was used to waiting. Suddenly there was a pop over the set. The background static quieted, and an uncertain voice could be heard. U.S. Warship 216, this is Ericsson Air Station, over? The person behind the voice released his transmit key, and the oddly tonal static filled the small metal room again. U.S. Warship 216, this is Ericsson Air Station, over. The crew looked at each other. They didn't know this voice, but even the station broadcasting the signal had changed over time. 
Much like the strain on their lives and the wear on the equipment, the crew wrote it off as a cost of the war. And Chief Yeoman Ledford marked down the transmissions in the ship's log. USS Grunion, this is Erickson Air Station. Please respond. Over. Captain Abelli cringed at the breach in radio discipline, but that much was undoubtedly attributable to the Air Force being the Air Force. Inter-service rivalries run as deep as their pride in the submarine fleet. USS Grunion, this is uh, uh, Erickson Air Station. Um, hey guys, uh, this is Senior Airman Jones. I, uh, I, I'm taking over for Master Sergeant Smith. Uh, he returned tired last year so if if i mess this up I, i'm sorry it's um about 0200 on the 25th of december uh, 2023 i guess it is now it, it, it's christmas again <laughs> and it's been kind of a well it's been kind of a crazy year you know airman jones continued for about 10 minutes in flagrant disregard of the standard radio etiquette, but no one broke into the circuit to interrupt him. He stuttered, he stammered, he clearly thought what he was doing was a little strange. But it was his duty for the night, and he was going to do it. And the crew of the Grunion hung on his every word. So, uh, uh I. I guess. Jones's voice broke a little, but no one said a word on the grunion. I, I guess that's about everything. We, we just wanted to let you know that we, we were still thinking of you, and, well, thank you. Yeah. Erickson Air Station out. In the silence that reigned supreme after Dole flipped the radio set back off, Captain Abele nodded. They remembered. And as long as they remembered, the Grunion would still be out here on patrol, protecting the United States from the enemy. As suddenly as the 70 souls appeared in the control room, they vanished. The captain glanced at the diving officer again, and a few seconds later the spectral boat sank once again beneath the waves its faintly glowing outline disturbing neither air nor water as it cut through both with supernatural ease. As a historical note, the USS Grunion, hull number Sierra Sierra 216, was lost with all hands off the coast of Kiska Island, Alaska, on or around 30 July 1942. She and her crew join another over 60 submarines and well over 4,400 sailors who are still on patrol eternally.